In this lecture, we're going to talk about gridding as applies to radio interferometers and synthesis imaging. However, a lot of what I'm going to say applies more generally to the problem of how you take data that is sampled as a function of a continuous variable and render it into a discrete form that you can use on a computer. So as we've discussed in other lectures, we have an array of telescopes. We feed all the signals from those telescopes back into a correlator, which does the correlation, and outputs for us as a function of antenna index for different pairs of antennas, I and J, as a function probably of frequency, the visibility that we measure. And the question is, now what do we do? Now we know basically from a previous lecture on synthesis imaging that in principle, these samples represent samples of the UV plane. And so we would like to put those down on the UV plane in the appropriate place so that we can Fourier transform that UV plane and get a picture of the sky in L and M coordinates. So how do we go about actually constructing this UV plane? So the first thing we need to know are the coordinates in the UV plane to which each of these visibilities output by the correlator correspond. And in order to do that, we need to know where our antennas were so that we can take that baseline for whichever antenna pair we choose, B sub i j, and measure it in wavelengths relative to some source direction, which will be our phase center, to get u, v, and w coordinates. Now the first thing we're going to want to do is to get rid of this w component, because we have fundamentally a two-dimensional plane that we want to put these samples into, that, and we want to do a two-dimensional Fourier transform to get to this picture of the sky. So we want to get rid of w. So basically what we've got to do is take our visibility, project out the w term, take that projected number, and stick it somewhere in this UV plane. Now dealing with the W term is not quite as simple as that, but we'll discuss that in a lecture on W projection. So in principle, I know my U and V coordinates, so I should be able to just stick my measurement at the appropriate U and V coordinate. However, it's not quite that simple, and that's where gridding comes in. So in practice, what's going to happen is I'll have a UV plane, which will be sampled at some interval. This is going to be some matrix on my computer, an array of numbers, and I'm going to have to choose where to put this number. And I'm going to have to make a decision about which pixel or which bin I end up putting this into. And the decisions I make here are going to have repercussions on the image that I'm ultimately able to make. Now because U and V are continuous coordinates, in practice this sample is going to fall somewhere on the UV plane that is not perfectly in the center of one of the pixels there. And I'm going to have to make a decision about what number to write into one or more of these pixels. Now the simplest thing you might think of doing is to just find the nearest pixel. So if this happened to lie close to the boundary, but let's say it's a little closer to the left-hand pixel here, I might just stick my number right into that pixel just to the left of it, shade that in. Now let's examine the repercussion of making that decision. Suppose I zoom in on that pixel. Now from the perspective of this Fourier transform, the number I write into this pixel acts as if it's been sampled right in the center of that bin. But in practice, my sample was actually sampled from a UV coordinate off to the side. So some amount of error is going to be introduced by pretending that this sample was actually sampled over here. And we can actually describe exactly what that error is. This process of having realigned our visibility measurement at a different coordinate can be described mathematically as taking the visibility that we measured, convolving it with some gridding kernel, G, which I'll write in the green color here. Now that gridding kernel is spreading out this true visibility with some kernel around it here that we've convolved by, and then resampling that convolved kernel at some point here, which is taking that convolved visibility and multiplying by a delta function centered at the true pixel center. So what was G in this case where we just chose to put our visibility sample directly into the center of the nearest pixel? Well it turns out that convolution G, that convolution kernel, is actually just a boxcar of the width of a pixel. That is for wherever your sample is, you draw a box of width one pixel around it and that box will overlap exactly one pixel center and that is the pixel at which it is resampled and placed. So in practice, gridding is convolving your true visibility by some kernel, that is your gridding kernel. And as we know, convolving your true visibilities by some kernel is the same thing as multiplying your true sky by the Fourier transform of that, just by the convolution theorem. 
Therefore, the result of this process is to take your true sky and multiply it by the Fourier transform of your gridding kernel. For this case, where we chose a gridding kernel that is a top hat function with the width of one pixel, the Fourier transform of that is going to be the two-dimensional equivalent of a sync function. And that means that your image over here is going to be multiplied by a kind of ugly function that is boxy and has side lobes sticking out of it. Now one way you can improve this is if you make your pixels smaller and smaller, then the width of this gridding kernel gets smaller and smaller, which means that on your image, using smaller pixels to grid with gives you larger or wider sync function. And so you may be able to arrange it such that the sync function is almost the width of your entire image, or at least the region that you care about, and then you've avoided some of the problems. And, and also by knowing precisely what your gridding function is, here is, you can potentially just divide it back out of your final image. Now unfortunately, adding pixels by subdividing these pixels down to some size that makes this gridding not a problem for you comes at a pretty steep computational cost. So you might ask, is there something I can do that grids things a little more reasonably such that I don't have to use such big fat pixels? Can I choose a different gridding kernel that allows me to get away with having bigger pixels and saves me some computational complexity? And the answer is yes. In fact, there are whole families of gridding kernels which you can look at in any digital signal processing textbook for convolving your true sample onto a grid. And in practice, what we would like is something that has a pretty tight bound. That is, that for any sample around here, maybe you only touch the pixels immediately neighboring it, or maybe, you know, at, at most another ring outward, such that for any one sample that you have, you only have to touch a reasonable number of pixels in order to grid that sample into your UV plane. And that you can still use rather fat pixels here so that you don't have an egregious number of pixels to deal with when you do a, your Fourier transform. So you'd like to pick a grid and kernel that has some reasonable amount of breadth here, but also goes to zero absolutely at some distance outward. So there are whole families of, of such kernels, and some of the favored ones today in synthesis imaging are spheroidal gridding functions, um, which are often called in the literature and in the world of digital signal processing as, as Kaiser, two-dimensional Kaiser windows, K-A-S-E-R. And, th and these themselves are a family of gridding functions that you can look at. And choosing appropriate gridding functions can both reduce side lobes of your gridding in the UV plane and reduce aliasing, which is the effect that a source off the side of your image or near to the side of it can have side lobes that wrap around the edge of your image and come back on the other side here. So that's gridding at its most basic form. Now there's some more advanced uses of gridding for improving the quality of your image. One of those has to do with W projection. One of those has to do with the effects of having a wide field of view. So in a very wide field of view, where perhaps your image is the entire sky or a projection of it, if you phased your array towards the very center of that, and you're looking 90 degrees to either horizon here, your instrument response can evolve substantially over that image. Which is to say that for any one baseline that you've chosen, you've tried to project out your W component here, with a phase, but that phase only applies in one direction, which is your phase center, and that phasing breaks down. And we'll discuss this in more detail in another lecture, but basically that phase error is a kernel of phase differences on your image. And to compensate for that, you could potentially use the Fourier transform of that pattern when you grid your measurement onto the UV plane. Similarly, your antenna beam for any one of these antenna elements may have a gain that changes across the sky. And if you want to capture any of that variation, that whole sky has been summed together into one number. But you can weight your visibility by the response that you knew it had in each direction by convolving with the Fourier transform of that primary beam here. So you may sense a common theme here. You can compensate for direction-dependent phases and direction-dependent gain by choosing a gridding kernel that is the Fourier transform of that. So in that sense, gridding 
is a way for you to use your prior knowledge of your calibration, particularly with direction dependent, in the construction of your image. And optimal image making that takes into account all of the information and calibration that you know is embedded in these visibilities can in some sense be handled in the gridding step. And that makes gridding one of the most important steps you can do in synthesis imaging. Now one final note here, this isn't strictly speaking gridding, but is worth mentioning at the same time, is that once you've constructed a UV plane here, where you've put into the UV plane at a bunch of different points, the samples of your array convolved with the appropriate gridding kernels that you've chosen, you may be interested in applying a windowing function here that is a, a multiplicative function in the UV plane in order to tweak how your image looks. Now one example of something that you might be interested in doing is overall providing a window function that maybe goes to zero towards the edge of your UV plane in either direction so that you're effectively convolving your image by the Fourier transform of that windowing function in order to reduce side lobes around sources that come about as a result of your sparse sampling of the UV plane. So you can apply windows in the UV plane that affect your imaging. You may also want to do things like if you're interested in imaging point sources, you might choose to downweight samples towards the center of the UV plane that tend to capture broad scale structure in the image domain. And another thing that is commonly done is you may accidentally have sampled nearby pixels repeatedly uh, in, in one place. And you may be interested in downweighting some of that information in your image just to have something that looks by eye more reasonable or more representative of the sky that you know and doesn't overrepresent these particular Fourier modes. And so sometimes there are weighting functions that are applied in the UV plane to artificially make the sampling more uniform. Now any weighting function you apply to the UV plane is going to reduce your signal to noise because ultimately you're choosing to not use all of the information in your array. You're downweighting some of the information. But nonetheless, that may be something that improves your image by making it more representative of the sky. And I mention this at the same time as gridding, just because applying windowing functions is essentially the inverse of gridding. It's instead of convolving your visibilities by a number to get a multiplicative effect in the image plane, it's multiplying your visibilities by a number in, to, in order to get a convolution in the image. So that's gridding as applies to radio interferometers for synthesis imaging.